Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another in our series, The Edge in Education. And as you know, this is an opportunity to engage the parent community on uh, trends in education and the direction ISP is taking. And um, one of the major purposes of doing this is so that parents are involved in the conversation. We need to, uh, education needs to evolve and become, as the title says here, create greater relevance for today's student, not yesterday's student, but tomorrow's student. And so that's part of ISP's mission, but that cannot be done without the parent community. And so your voice and your involvement in understanding in what the school is trying to accomplish is extremely important, which is why I'm using this microphone and why we film this so that we can post it on our website so other community members also have an opportunity uh, to, to view and to hear what we're talking about. Today we have with us Dr. Mark Frankel. You may have heard the name Mark Frankel before. Uh, our upper school principal is also Dr. Mark Frankel. Uh, this Mark Frankel has his first name, the last letter of his first name spelled with a C. And I think they have a different middle initial, different middle initial. So uh, they're different in many other ways as well. I've known uh, Mark, uh, Dr. Frankel, for many years. Uh, he is very well known in the international school community. I think it's probably fair to say he not only works with hundreds of schools in the United States and around the world, but probably thousands, and, uh, and for a very long period of time. Uh, so uh, Mark does board training uh, and governance uh, uh, training. Mark uh, does uh, leadership training, strategic work with schools, le uh, many uh, different facets of uh, school life Mark is involved with. It's really a benefit to us to have his involvement because over a long period of time we have an outside expert who comes back to the school and knows the school's long-term history, has the institutional memory. Uh, and so Mark can share with, with you his wealth of knowledge about not only, not specifically about ISP, but schools around the world and where they're going and how they are trying to remain relevant in today's rapidly changing world. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Mark Frankel. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Now that the challenge is to live up to that, Ani. Appreciate the introduction. Wow, it's a lot of you. Thanks for coming out this morning. It's great, great, beautiful day out there. Wow. Long commute from the hotel up the street down the, down the way. It was nice, nice, nice walk. Well, good to be back and uh, good, good to see new faces and some familiar faces. So we're going to spend the next hour or so together, more or less, depending on you and, and how much you talk back to this and get, in, get involved in discussion. Uh, I apologize to those of you for whom American English is not your native language. I'll be doing this in badly accented American English. So if I say something that's not clear or use uh, a colloquialism that doesn't quite translate, let me know, and I'm happy to go back over it, please. Don't be bashful about that. Um, let's see, I need a little bit more about you, though, as, as we start out. So you're all parents at ISP. Um, I know some of you are, are board members, but uh, how many have parents in the upper school, in the, in the high school? So you're not 9 to 12, grades 9 to 12. Great, great, great. So you're, you, you guys are getting done. You're, you're almost at that stage, all right? And how many of you are in the middle school, which is what here, Arnie? Is six through eight. Six through eight. Six through eight, a few of you, great. Uh, and you've got a ways to go yet. And uh, in elementary school and below. There's a, there's a whole bunch of you, and, and you're just starting out. Great. Well, we're going to have something to say for all three of you groups that are in sort of age cohorts in the school with kids. And for those of you who are, are looking at university admissions on the doorstep, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. And for those of you who are uh, back at the sort of beginning and wondering what the course ahead in school looks like, we'll, we'll talk a, a bit about those things as well. So uh, let me throw out a question to you. It's, it's something that, hi, right, come on and join us that I think about a lot when I go to schools, and I think about a lot in my own life. My, my son went through private and dependent schools uh, in the United States and, and now is uh, 29 and, and li lives away. And as, as we say, he's off the family payroll, and we're trying to keep it that way. Uh, but, but still, even with a 29-year-old, there's, there's questions that keep coming up. And I'll pose one of those to you, just because I'm really curious to hear where your thoughts are with this. Oh, by the way, if, if you see the slides online, you can uh, get the contact info. And if there's, you want a question, you want to ask me for a reference, or I mention a book or something, and you want to go back to it, I'm, I'm happy to, to send that to you. What keeps you awake at night when you think about your child's future? 
What, what are the kinds of things? I'd like you to turn to, to, I'd like you to turn your tables for just a moment uh, and, and share with each other briefly what keeps you awake at night, and then we'll just get some you know, input to that for the group. But get to know the people around you. What keeps you awake at night when you think about your kids' future? <laughs> Throw out some things. What, what, did you, what did you hear at your table? What did you say? Anyone? Just toss it out. Yep. Identifying the strengths of the child. Find the strengths of the child. OK, find those. Yeah. It's often easy to find not so strengths. So strengths, yeah. Someone else? Anyone? Silent. Finding stability in the world, finding a, a rock to stand on. Yeah, good luck with that. That's, uh, <laughs> we're all looking for that. But right, that's the stability. What, what does that hold for people? And uh, recognizing that our kids need some sort of base. Yes? I think in our table, at least the three of us discussed the issue of. Hi. <laughs> we won't amplify, but we're recording it. So. Oh, OK. So anyway, uh, what we discussed at our table was the issue of our children coming out of university with debt, settled with debt. And so this is a major issue, not only in the United States, but I think in other parts too. Okay. Um, and it's kept you awake at night and you somewhat awake at night. So post-college debt, uh, what, what, what will that be like? Somebody else. meaningful work and work that really excites them, brings them joy and, and happiness and not feel that, you know, they have to sort of sell out and do something, you know, that doesn't align with their talents. Okay. So. Meaningful work, something that engages them, something that they want to do, good. That's, that's going to become, as we're going to see in just a moment, increasingly a challenge for kids. Is, uh, somebody else? I mean, nothing keeps you awake at night? Are you? Well, I, I, I mean, I worry a lot about the kind of physical environment that our children are going to in inherit. So the consequences of the decisions we're making now. <laughs> so you, climate change, Cli uh, yes. uh, toxicity, yeah. that sort of thing. Indeed. Right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, we also talked about uh, helping our children to make the right choice and to stick to that choice and to put the efforts that the, that choice deserves to succeed. Making the right choices. And, that, and that's not just about school. That's kind of in life, right? Somebody else keeps you awake at night. <laughs> I'm getting my exercise. <laughs> <laughs> now that my children are already in the college in um, third year and second year, mm. um, what me wakes uh, keeps awake awake at nights is what they're gonna do after. Okay, uh, my son is doing PPE. And I asked him, what are, you, what are you gonna do after? Political philosophy and economy? And I don't, I don't know, like, I just was curious what, you, what your future plans are. Mm -hmm. And he said, mom, it's not about what you study and um, it's about how you apply what your knowledge after. So um, I'm learning how to apply from ISP. I have this thought of how to apply whatever knowledge I already got and <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, he has a point, but it's still, um, I'm worried. <laughs> sure, sure. Right. Anybody else? The people who just came in were asking, what, what keeps you awake at night when you think about your child's future? What else? Was Good things. Got making good choices, what's after college for them, finding meaningful work, uh, finding a rock to stand on in a stable world. Yes, Radek. We also talked about their social skills, you know, how to actually interact within the society, how to find the right partner for life, etc. Right. Yeah, well, what you're really saying, all of you, I think, or the, the, your answers is it's, yes, it's about school, but it's about more than that. It's m more than just the cognitive aspect of life. It's about values, character. That's the choices piece. It's about finding partner, social skills, big, big, big job ahead. It's this, this raising humans is not easy work, is it? There's lots of things that would be easier. Well, great, you know, there's interesting, that's a, uh, I ask that question uh, about, uh, with every group I go, go to around the world, and I don't do a lot of these presentations with parents, more with boards and faculty and administrative teams and that kind of thing, because 
there really aren't all that many schools that do this kind of, of uh, series for you. So I'm, I'm thrilled that Arnie and ISP are doing it. But wherever I've asked the world, on every continent, uh, even in the West Bank and Gaza, the same answers get given. It's the same stuff that people worry about. Um, what's going to happen to my kid after school, after college? What's gonna ha will they make good choices? Will they find the right partner and friends? It's all the, uh, all the unknowns that we can't really answer, right? That's what keeps us awake at night. It, by the way, it, tr it doesn't get better. For those of you who have older kids, uh, it, it, <laughs> it changes a bit. Uh, but it doesn't get better. You still have things that keep you up at night about your kids. And, uh, and I'm sure if you had uh, asked my parents, they're, they're gone now, but if you'd asked them or when they were in their 90s, they would have still said something kept them awake at night about me. So that's, that's probably endemic to the life of being, being a parent. Uh, let's, let's unpack a few things. Uh, how many of you have been in other international schools, either in Prague or somewhere else in the world? Okay, so repeat customers of some place, ve veterans of... Good. Connoisseurs, we call those. You, you, know, you know what you're looking at. Well, I'm going to be particularly interested to hear from, from, from some, some of you in a moment. But first, uh, let, let's pose a question. Uh, state of the field in international schools. You, you, you bought into one. You're sending your kid here. I thought you ought to know a little bit about what's happening in the landscape of international schools and where ISP fits in. Uh, what was the first international school in the world? Any idea? Where was it? What was it? Anyone remember? And more importantly, who wrote its mission statement, but we'll get to that. We're, no, no idea what it was? Arnie, I, should, you know? I should know that. My first guess was Eunice, but it's probably not. It was the London International College, uh, Spring Grove and Hounslow, <coughs> out, out by what's now Heathrow. And it was in, oh, the second half of the 19th century. So that's it. That's a pic drawing of it. It was 1866 to 1889. Didn't have a long history, but is considered the first international school. The mission statement was this. The pupils, in passing from one language and nation to another, would find no notable change in the course of study to retard the progress of their education. <laughs> Sound kind of familiar to you? That's sort of like it? So those of you who have been to more than one international school, that's part of the value of the IB, is you can flow from place to place. And it's not perfectly seamless, but as close to it as it gets, and the, the language issue isn't there. Now you're wondering who, who wrote that, by the way. He, he was on their governing board, <laughs> Charles Dickens. So curiosity, isn't it? <laughs> so this thing called ISP really comes from a long history of international schools, going all the way back to, to this mission statement, which could still, with a little bit more 21st century language in it, uh, apply to a great many international schools today. Yep, that's curious. So uh, ISC research in the UK purports to track international schools worldwide, and uh, they issue about every couple times a year uh, a, a scan of how many schools there are, how many students, so forth. The latest from them is from May, the end of the last school year in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, that's it, 9,549 uh, branded international schools in the world. That's, that's a whole bunch. That's up from uh, less than 600 30 years ago. Now, about 6,000 of those are in one country and, that's, uh, and have opened within the past 10 years. So that's a whole different, a different universe. You, you know the country, China. 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 Yeah. Uh, and only about, by my count, and I'm, I'm probably a little bit off, uh, Arnie may know better, only about 400, maybe 350, are true peers in the sense that they are nonprofits organized to serve a heterogeneous international clientele like ISP. The problem, though, is that schools like ISP are increasingly competing with those other 9,000 schools for talent when it comes to administrators and teachers. And uh, if you've got one of those next door to you, for students and families, because uh, the market is becoming increasingly fragmented. And that's a whole other topic we, we could spend a day on, but just want to get a sense of the size of the market. The thing that's getting a lot of attention is that not so much the 5 million students as it's the 48 billion U.S. in uh, fee income that's not lost on the venture capital world. So huge venture capital plays right now in the for-profit education space, uh, Nord Anglia, which uh, I think they operate around here, don't they? Yes, they, they do. They do. Uh, they were just bought out 
by a Canadian venture capital company that puts several billion dollars into them. That comes with a certain expectation on rate of return. Uh, and so there's a lot of money flowing into this sector and a lot of, a lot of competition for schools as well. The question always becomes if there's, if you've got 9,549 uh, well, give or take, competitors, and gracious, by the time ISC issues its fall scan, that may well be north of 10. Uh, the, the question becomes, how do you know a good one when you see it, right? What, what, is it, what does it look like? How would you recognize it? So uh, I'm going to throw that one out to you for a second, you've, especially those of you who have um, shopped. You've been at more than one international school. How do you know a good school when you see it? What, what, Rowena? When I walk around, I just... Just listen to what's going on in the classroom. Okay, how much learning do I feel is going on in these classrooms? It's quite hard to use classrooms if I'm now in the tour. But I, Good. Oh, but how much? I just listen to the communication between the pupils and the... And, and what exactly do you... I'm going to press on that. Do you hear that signals to you that learning is going on? Um, I feel that students are engaged and responsive and there's a kind of lively communication between the the um, students and the teachers and there's that kind of level of engagement and I also look at the behavior of the children in the corridor are they purposeful are they um, enthusiastic about moving on to their next lesson so I'm very much looking at the children what the children are doing when I'm walking around yeah great thanks for that someone else what, how do you know a good school when you see it Rhoda Uh, so I, I visited ISP on the 30th of December uh, a few years ago. I came with my kids, so the school was empty. There <laughs> was nobody here. <laughs> uh, but I, we've got the sense that it's a really a place for students. And you see this amazing artwork on the, on the, on the walls. And the school is designed for students and for learning. It's not a... It's not a, a, an empty trunk, in mean, meaning that it's an a, you know, outstanding facilities and there is nothing else what can be really attached in terms of quality. So uh, you can even, <laughs> judging the, the quality of institution by, by the way how it treats uh, students' work and, and, uh, and organization of, of spaces. So even coming on an empty day, you were looking for artifacts that say it's about the students. Okay. Anybody else? No great school when you see one. What would, what would, it, what would you see? Yeah. Um, I think it's really about the teaching. Um, my mother was a teacher for 20 years, and she always said, don't be you know, snowed by the bells and whistles at a place. Because she said, in her opinion, um, a school is as good as any given teacher in any given year. And I've been impressed over and over with ISP teachers, just individually, and, and um, not only their their professionalism, but also their kindness. So. Okay, so it's about the, the teachers and about the human interaction that goes on in that space. Right. And my opinion is, um, for like ISP, my kids are happy here, and I feel that um, that's the most important. I know exactly that um, they, they're getting good education, but they are really happy. And I was in Boston last week, and my daughter told me that, you know, Mom, now that I'm out of ISP, I realized how lucky I was to go there and um, how much, how much uh, self-confidence confidence I earned and um, how much knowledge I received. I was very happy to hear that. And, um, I think ISP is a great place, and I'm happy with the school. And I, um, we went to different school for three years, and you, you, um, even from the teachers, you could hear that um, they're really unhappy with the management. Management, and they're ac actually, it's not, it wasn't non-profit school; it's a private school, but um, not like ISP. <laughs> they're ki kind of the, mm, it's a profit school. So um, the teachers and students could feel it. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, so accreditation, who actually reviews the school internationally, for one thing. Um, the student yearbook, how well it's designed and done and how active it shows up. And then also alumni, what have they done in their future lives. Uh, one thing that was different from NITO at Santiago in this school is NITO had an Olympic-sized swimming pool in this space. Lacks it so. <laughs> 
got to work on that. <laughs> Our kids have to suffer something, don't they? And the, the, the acute uh, swimming pool deprivation syndrome is something you can look forward with. Uh, right. Well, th those are great answers, and, and I, I appreciate I, I, I like all of them, um, because you're really talking about the many different ways in which one, one would understand that it's a, a, you know, a, good, a school is good. We're going to unpack some more of that and see how your answers compare to uh, the, the observations from the field in a moment. We'll see if we can do some comparison with that. And Marina, after what you said, I now know I have to get to my last slide uh, for, the, for the, your statement from your child. If, if, you, if I don't make it to the last slide, uh, the quote, then come up to see me afterward and we'll, we'll work it in. Um, you know, there's this weird thing called the modern education quantum, which is this sort of formula that we've been stuck with in schools for a long time. It's X students in Y classrooms with Z teachers for C number of years. Uh, in, in my day, the late Pleistocene era, that, that was uh, 12 years, but uh, today it's increasingly 14, 16, and, and uh, 17 and a half years, and sometimes even more than that. Divided by scores, how'd they do? So Friday morning, I was at some meetings in Kuala Lumpur where the area education officer from the uh, US State Department began a speech to uh, two and a half thousand educators in that region by saying, all of you come from great schools. How we know your schools are great is they all have great SAT scores, IB results, and get the kids into elite universities. Okay, that's, that's one set of metrics for evaluating a great school. And then, then he went on from there, but that was it. That, that was, the, 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 what was what was put out there. So that's been our, our what we euphemistically call the modern education quantum for a long time. In fact, we can even go back and see it uh, a long time ago. There is a Sumerian classroom from 2000 BC, okay? You get a little history tour here for a moment. It's kind of, kind of fun. Uh, so you can see, kind of recognize rows there, right? You could almost imagine where the teacher is. There's an early Renaissance uh, classroom, not a great picture of it, but it's a, a, a decent enough image that you can get what they're talking about. Uh, there's a US classroom around 1890. Um, yep, that looks recognizably familiar. Uh, th that must have been uh, a US classroom circa 1940. So there's our 40 piece, uh, unmistakable hairstyles uh, about. There's uh, 1960, so we're kind of <laughs> getting back to my era there. This is looking real familiar. And um, there's about 2015. So w w even though we're seeing some changes in the shape of things, it's still recognizable that you have X number of students with Y number of teachers in Z number of classrooms. What that formula is starting to break down in some important ways that I'd like to talk with you about. And I think it, it speaks to things happening here at ISP. I had a chance to read your accreditation report. Um, it's, it's all, you could always brag to your sister at Christmas that you know, your kids go to a school accredited by the same organization that accredits Harvard. So see, now that may be bragging rights. Uh, I read your accreditation report. I looked at several other things from the school. So I know some things, you're, you're changing the geography of learning in the school and within classrooms. But we still have that formula that's there. So it's changing. And we're gonna talk about how it's changing in some ways. And also what's changing is the denominator, the scores as, as the metric of, of outcome. Modern grading, what's the history of modern grading? The A, B, C, D, E rubric for grading. When did that start? Any idea? Pardon? End of 19th century. Of 19th century. Any other takers for another time? Pardon me? I, I said anyone else have another time? Anyone want to throw out a, we'll do a, we'll do a pool. Okay. End of 19th century, earlier than that, anyone think? Clive's nodding in the back. Clive thinks it was handed down when Moses came from the mountain. It was one of the, ta one of the tablets. We treat it like that, don't we? We, we treat it like somehow this, this rubric is, is sacred, it's been given to us. Uh, it came from Mount Holyoke College in 1897. So, right, you're right. You, you can see some pieces that look, certainly evaluation was done, people looked at rubrics, but the, the modern grading system came just recent. It's um, 120 years old. That's, People are really surprised when you say that because they, they almost do think it came down from tablets. So we're gonna talk now about 17 
big things, seven big changes, four big convergences, five big implications, and one big problem. So we're going to try to run through this. I do want you to speak back to it, so feel free to ask questions. I may stop and ask a question of you, but I'm um, just point out some observations. This is the stuff we're seeing in the field. Seven big changes. Work. Work's changing. It's going to change even more. In fact, a key question about work is whether the next 50 years will produce epic mass unemployment on a scale that the world has never known. We simply don't need people working. Automation will take care of it. And with ever-increasing reliable AI, this looks ever more possible. In fact, a f education futurist, a friend of mine was talking to us at, at the board I serve on in uh, California, in Los Angeles, a city I don't live in, and a school I've never had a child in, but it's where I've been on the board for 12 years. And her comment was, in the future, there will be two kinds of people. People who work for machines and people who tell the machines what to do. And which do you want your kid to be? So it's an interesting. The third group, I'd say, would be people who simply have no jobs because it's, it's, there's, no, there's no places in the economy for them. And that's increasingly going to be a social challenge for the world. It's something our kids will have to deal with and a problem that we're all going to have to solve over the next few years is what do we do when up to 40% of the adult working age workforce is not employed? And that's where you get the proposals for universal basic income and a bunch of other things. But work is changing. Knowledge is changing. The big change about knowledge, this is big. It's free. There is no value add in what you know. Sorry to tell you that. <laughs> because you can find it out. It's commodified. Knowledge is a commodity. You want to know it, you can find it out. You want to know when the first international school was, you can find that out in about 10, 10 minutes, 8 minutes. You want to know when the grading system, grading system began? You can find that out very quickly. All this information is publicly available, ubiquitous, 24-7, streamed to us on our smartphones. What, now, I'm not saying you don't need to know your basic math facts, so you don't need to have a, a basic command of grammar or so forth. But at some level, knowledge is not the, the differentiator, because it's free. Technology changing. AI is going to be as disruptive to the tech world as the personal computer was back in my day. Remember the famous quote from the uh, CEO at Xerox? It's a famous quote. He said he could not possibly imagine a scenario under which anybody would want a personal computer in their house. <laughs> right? Yeah. That, that turned out really well for Xerox, didn't it? Not, not so well, right? Because IBM left in, then Apple, and, and the rest is, is history. So AI is going to be like, it's easy to look at AI right now and say, okay, Disney may be big in AI, but when AI becomes the platform that treats you at the hospital, that becomes interesting and a game changer. And that's increasingly the case. You don't see it, you don't feel it, but your clinician is interfacing with AI all the time now through the uh, digital uh, record system. Higher education is changing. So if you have a kid in higher education, that landscape has gotten really weird in the past few years. And the two big, put aside all the um, affordability, debt, sustainability issues, not that they're not important, they're very important. Let's just get, get within the mechanics of it. The demand for higher education is redistributing around the world. And every year this gets more so, where US universities become less desirable and more students from international schools matriculate to other schools outside the US. Some in the UK, some in Canada, but increasingly in the EU and Australia. So business school rankings are now fascinating to look at. 15 years ago, eight of the top 10 business schools in the world by most sets of rankings, if we can quibble about that one at another time, were in North America. Today, only three are. INSEAD, IMD, others have gone way up the list. UK schools. So that landscape is changing dramatically, which means that we're going we're to talk implications in a moment, but you might be jumping ahead of thinking that schools like ISP have to get students ready for more varied university destinations. 
some of which may not be operating in English. Geopolitics, that's just stability question. All the stuff that we can't control. And the, the bad news is it seems to be infectious if you watch the Brazilian election last week. Climate, so the toxicity in the world, what, 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 what will our kids inherit? Climate change, we could work that one infinitely. I, I can say that here, right? Climate change, these people believe in climate change? Okay, yeah. yes. I'm good. good. Hey, I'm from the US, you know, you never know if that's okay to say or not in places. Um, demography, writ large and writ small. And the de demography change, which is most interesting for us, really is about expat flows in schools. So what the world looks like is fewer Anglophone expats and more of everything else. So while expat flows are up, fewer of them are from the US, Canada, and UK. More of them are from other places, like many of you are. And that begins to change some of the calculus for, for schools a bit in terms of who's coming to us and what they're coming for and how we have to serve them better. Seven big changes. Other things you're seeing out there in the landscape? These, these are boulders in the pond. What, what are you seeing? Any bigger, smaller? Okay. <coughs> yep. You mentioned uh, knowledge is free, but uh, I think data is free. Uh, information is almost free, but knowledge is the more complicated part, which is on top of those two. And uh, that is still, for the next several decades, I presume uh, the human brain is going to supersede or exceed uh, the ability of machines. And that's what people also in the IT, including those who are working on artificial intelligence, are pointing out that it's, that's going to take some time when the, before the knowledge is of human, the ability of human brain is caught up by machines. That's all. So I'm not sure knowledge is free yet. OK. Well, I'm going to come back to you in a moment on that. But let's, yep. Mark? Um, uh, kind of social, I get tribalism, a cohort. We are in a elite cosmopolitan cohort. There are other cohorts to be aware of. There are. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to, to think about, uh, forgive me for using a US example, but if, if you look at Manhattan in New York City, it voted 85% uh, for Hillary Clinton in the, uh, the last election. Uh, but just uh, how far is Staten Island? Uh, about, but not, not straight miles, about three or four? Yeah, three or four miles. It voted 75% for Trump. Right, right there, same, same city. Fascinating. Fascinating. What? <laughs> Fresh kills, yeah, I know. That, that horribly named, uh, yeah, dumb. But that's interesting, yeah, this whole the, the, the landscape of what do we share, what happens when our community engages with others, how will our kids be prepared to engage with others. Big changes. Uh, let's talk about four big convergences. This gets a little more out there, but it, it's certainly the stuff we're seeing, K-12 and higher education. It's, it's blending. It used to be K-12 was, was and, and higher ed were non-overlapping magisteria, uh, but they're increasingly blurring together. So really out there schools, are having kids not just graduating with university credits. That's, that's child's play. Everybody's done that for a long time. But graduating having had the experience of sitting in a university classroom or seminar room with university students and university professors. And what that's doing as a game changer is less about credits and more about the skills of how you go to university. Because we've got this problem in the world, uh, and it's, it's data which is, is not publicized by schools, but the mean years to graduation in the United States, if you, I only know this for the US universities. So an entering freshman this year, Emma's a freshman this year, or is this her second year? First year. Any idea what's the mean years to graduation at a US university? Average. Mm. Any idea? Five and a half and climbing. Mm. Oh, yeah, you start, so, geez, that's five and a half years of tuition, right? Yeah. You suddenly hit you. Yeah, so that means four years is so yesterday, five and a half. And 51% of students that enter U.S. universities and graduate, graduate from a school different than where they started. That's, by the way, how, part of the reason how you got to five and a half. 
you know, no one experiences changing universities as a credit enhancing mm -hmm. thing. So you, you lose something. So one of the things we're seeing is more out there schools focusing on how do we blur that boundary between this and higher ed, not just because learning and our, our high school kids are perfectly capable of doing university level work. But how do we create more of knowing how to sit in that classroom, work independently, do that work, live on your own, do various things of that nature, blurring of that boundary. School and work is blurring. Not just internships anymore, full on co-op placements. So many universities have done this for years. Drexel University in Philadelphia has had a noted uh, co-op placement program for decades now. We're seeing more and more upper schools, high schools doing that as well, finding ways to build ties to industry so that uh, students who are interested in a health careers or the biological sciences are working alongside physicians and microbiologists in healthcare settings. And that, that takes authenticity in learning up a notch. Because not only are they now learning to work like them, they're learning side by side with the people who are actually in the field and doing it. It also starts to break down the boundary uh, between the what, what's a teacher? You know, is the teacher in the school the person who provides the knowledge? Not so much anymore as it is the person who coordinates the interface with all this outside world. Info and biotech. Infotech and biotech. So maybe this is where the, the brain gets to be most important. Um, my friend, who's the chief of cardiology at Cedar sinai in L.A., was walking me through this a couple of weeks ago because we were, we were talking about how, uh, a, how AI is getting into medicine. So if you're a patient who comes in to Cedar sinai all your data gets input. The algorithm forecasts a treatment plan for you. And the treatment plan is amazingly accurate to what a team of consulting physicians would prescribe. What it gets around is missing something because it's capable of factoring into account thousands of pieces of data. And on net, the outcomes are better than with live human doctors alone doing it. It's interesting. It's an interesting result. So Uber and self-driving cars, hospitals and self-driving medicine. Cognitive and emotional intelligence. So it used to be our schools back in my day, were mostly about cognitive intelligence. It focused on what people knew, what certain skill sets they had developed, how quickly they could do computations, whether they could do long division. That stuff's table stakes a long time ago. Now it's much more about can you do all that stuff and be a good human being? Can you do all that stuff and have the social skills to fit in when you get to work? because that's what's going to make you, a, mean, finding a meaningful job is one thing. Being successful there is all about what we've used to call the soft stuff, the, the emotional intelligence skills. So we're tracking those. This is curious. Uh, when, we get, when we look back here, oh, no, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go back, hit the wrong button. Forgive me. When we talk about changes in the world of work, one of those pictures is a workplace. And one of those pictures is a school, upper school. Uh, can you tell which is which? The, up, the workplace is an advertising agency, by the way. I should say that. Any idea? Yeah, uh, what are you saying? Workplace. workplace to the right, up there, okay. Workplace down to the right, and, okay. The chaotic one is probably the workplace. Up there? It's interesting. People have all kinds of different answers to that. Someone said, oh yeah, that's got to be the workplace, the school, because that green thing is uh, in, the, in the child division at Ikea. So, you know, I, I, I people have different reasons. The, uh, the thing, the picture with the green thing, the upper left, is the workplace. That's the ad agency. What you're not seeing, by the way, is the wall over here, because if the wall, wall over here is garage doors, and if it went up, it goes out on the beach. Uh, that, that's their location. This is the school. The problem is you can't tell, really. I mean, you, you can get into quibbling about individual elements in the picture, but the school spaces are increasingly looking like the work spaces and vice versa. You know what WeWork is? WeWork modular co-working spaces? Yeah, it's school now. Yeah, that's, that's what it's all becoming. All right, five big implications. So what does this mean for, for ISP, schools like IFP? Uh, democratic shifts within schools are happening. Demographic shifts are occurring within you, within populations. It's very unlikely 
that the community at ISP will look exactly like it does today in a few years. It's going to keep morphing and become ever more heterogeneous. If we were in uh, Asia, it would be very easy for it to become 100% uh, Chinese, Thai, Japanese, Korean. It's all progressive now. The school that I'm a board member at is a, a highly progressive school. We've never given a grade in the 50-year history of the school. We have uh, never uh, done this kind of standard evaluation rubrics. I'll put our university admissions list up against anybody's in the end. But what we're seeing is that more and more schools are copying what we used to call progressive pedagogies, including ISP in, in large measure. Students are both more and less mature at the same time. If you want something really scary, um, it's ha well, we're, we're after Halloween now, so I can say this. So want something really scary as a parent? Go pick up Gene Twenge's book, I-Gen, Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E, I-Gen, G-E-N. It's about the pernicious effects of, of social media on middle schoolers, which, just a parenthetic aside, is the fastest growing population at risk for suicide, middle schoolers. Middle school is the new high school. All the, all the social problems that used to affect high schools have backed down into middle school now. It's only a matter of time before they back down into high school, into elementary school. So 2007, the uptick in suicide attempts and completions in middle schoolers began around the world, and it has shown no signs of abating. It's getting steeper. What happened in 2007? iPhone. Yeah. iPhone. Ubiquitous social media. Now you know instantly that you were omitted from your friend's hangout this weekend. So you, you see the pictures streamed live on, on the screen. So that's putting schools more in the psychotherapy business. It's upping the ante for what our counselors are doing and for the social support that schools are needing to provide. That modern education quantum is finally eroding. We're seeing a breakdown of that class, teacher, student, ironclad rubric as it's morphing out into work, it's morphing out into higher ed and into much more project-based environments. And doing is replacing knowing as a differentiator. It's been about 10 years since uh, Tony Wagner, if you know Tony's work, uh, famously said the world doesn't care if you're smarter than a fifth grader, it cares if you know what to do with that information. You can use it and apply it. Whoops. It was one, was there one more? I think there was down at the bottom. No, that's it. That's the five big implications. So, we have one big problem. It's a problem that, that ISP, more than most other schools I go to, has been able to get past. The big problem is conservatism. So, try this on. For, not, not political conservatism. Conservatism about what people want schools to be doing with their kids. So, try this on for a second. 1960. Gallbladder surgery. Four to six inch abdominal incision, separation of or cutting through muscles, accessing the gallbladder under the liver. Recovery time was two to three months if you were lucky, and it was a four plus day hospitalization. Okay? 2018, gallbladder surgery is now minimally invasive, laparoscopic, robotic assisted, single opening in the belly button, and the patient usually goes home the same day, unless there's a complication. Now, which surgery would you like to have? Did you, okay, probably neither, but if you had to have your, your gallbladder out, I don't think we're going to have any takers going back and say, give me that old 1960 surgery, right? We're just not going to go back there. The problem is that for us as educational thinkers, 1960, school consisted of X plus Y plus Z. In 2018, it still does. And so, well, technology, and I don't just mean the devices, the whole panoply of technologies, eventually enable the first real disruption. Will parents and teachers accept it? Because when it comes to school, we tend to become incredibly conservative with our kids. So schools like ISP, and I think ISP has done this really well, play this interesting uh, game always of trying to push a little bit out, but not get too far, and then bring the community along with you. But what's happening are some really fundamental shifts out there in schools. Some of it is way cool, and some of it is way scary when you think about the kind of world that we could be moving into. What do students need for their futures? Question I ponder a great deal. What do you think? 
Think about for the future of students. What do they need? Critical thinking skills. Critical thinking skills. There's a good one. Something else. I'll restate what you say so you don't have to run around, okay? Somebody else. Critical thinking skills. What else? What do they need? Language and understanding things. Uh, Sorry, more languages. More languages. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. Okay. Networking. Networking, which a little bit of the emotional intelligence is important to have a network that's any good for you. Yeah. Right. Somebody else. What do, you, what do students need for their futures? Programming skills. Programming skills. Flexibility. Flexibility. Could you say just some more about that? Meaning? Uh, meaning that you have to adapt to new situations, new countries, new friends, new uh, jobs, and things like that. Right. right. Communication skills. Communication skills. Right. If you're doing all that flexing, you're going to need to be able to communicate with a lot of different people who may not be exactly like you. Teamwork. You know, it's interesting you say that. I had a conversation with my son uh, not long ago. I, I rarely bring, bring him into these conversations, but uh, I'll, tell it, I'll re retell it. Um, like me, uh, my, my goal in school was just to get through it and get on to what was next. You know, just, it was, that, that was pretty much it. He had the same mindset to it, as, you know, get me through this. But he went to, at least in secondary school, a very progressive school with a project-based curriculum and went to a university that used entirely a project-based curriculum in his media business degree. Um, that, and it worked, worked wonderfully for him, I thought, although he complained about it continuously through the whole thing. <laughs> so uh, he's leading task teams now. He works in that ad agency, by the way, the picture that was up there, um, doing commercials uh, for, for a, a large company and filming crews. He's a, a creative director, so he puts together the project, does the portfolio, does the design of it. Um, high is the crew that implements it. So I said, so all those years in school, did you learn anything that really helped you? And he said, well, not a lot except for one thing. <laughs> Any idea what he said? He said, I learned what you do with the member of the team that's not carrying their weight, mm. right? Because there's always that member. And that happened really early for him. So teamwork is about not just how do I get along, it's how do I manage this, how do we work around people. Great. What we know about what students need and what you're saying is that they need a certain capacity when they go into the future, and that's the ability to figure stuff out. So yeah, they need the math facts, but they're going to need to know how when they get out there and are in a place or a setting where there aren't the usual rules or there's something really different, how they can then apply what they know or find out the new stuff they need to know in order to be successful there. A lot of challenges for the national schools. Very quickly, different students, different needs, more uh, SCN, uh, EAL support, um, self-pay families as the demography changes, demand more, driving costs more, driving tuition ever higher. Has ISP gotten cheaper lately for anybody? No, no, no. <laughs> not, not gonna either by the way, because your productivity has gone down in international schools, te teacher productivity has dropped 40% since 1980. Well, 39, but who's quibbling? We, we have the, the number of data, because you have to have more adults producing students to be the counselors, learning support people. Attracting and retaining talent. Rebuilding the airplane while it's in the air. You know, once this, you don't have the luxury of shutting school down for three years and re-engineering it and starting over again. You have to keep fixing it and sending students on to a more varied array of destinations. And this one, unification in the face of polarization. You said tribe earlier. There's even within international schools, there are tribes. And ours is a very um, polarizing world right now and finding ways to bring people together. So how do you know a great school when you see one? Here's how I gauge it. When I walk around and walk into a school like this, when I stop off for visits in places and then we'll have a discussion, community. What does that feel like? Maybe it's the buzz in the air, but it's also people like this. You come in and sit down together and you listen to something like this, or you discuss and you participate. It's what happens out here in the morning and the drop-off. You can say, isn't everywhere? Yeah, everybody's got a drop-off line. But what's the vibe in the drop-off line? What's the tone? What's the ambiance in the parent community? Great schools have great communities. And that's as intentional, as, as strange as it may seem, 
they get very intentional about community. Second, engagement. Everybody's engaged. Students are engaged. There are student engagement surveys that schools use to measure this. But also, parents are engaged. Teachers are engaged. Now, someone's saying, gee, what do you mean? Teachers are engaged, aren't they? they aren't they really engaged? Not all. Not everybody. But great schools beat the Gallup organization odds. If you know Gallup, they do lots of surveying in schools. And they tell us that even in international schools, we've up to 20% of our teachers aren't particularly engaged at any given time. Great schools beat that number. Learning. Great learning is going on. And here's the thing. Kids themselves report it. Parents see it happening with their kids. They don't know how it happens, but it somehow happens. And they see it evidenced in a variety of ways. So at our school, where I'm a board member, our graduation exercise is a great display of what students get to know. We take Ted Size's dictum of graduation by demonstration very seriously. So graduating isn't about just compiling credits. It's about doing a cumulative project and an oral's defense of it in front of a group. When you see that, you say, wow, students have learned something. What, what do students know how to do and can do with what they know? Doing is that other piece. They're out there. They're in the community. They're around. The, the barriers between school and city have been broken down, between school and higher ed and business. And that's beyond borders. That's how I, how I gauge it. So your learning principles, pulled these up last night, was looking at the, at the ISP learning principles. I get excited when I see things like this. And you could say, wow, uh, doesn't every school have? No, not every school does. And schools that have learning principles don't always have the words that I bolded up there. The bolding is mine. The, uh, the rest is, is your text. Curiosity, knowing what and why, how to go further, persist, relevant, rich, connect, complex ideas, apply learning, and feel a sense of safety and belonging. It's great stuff. It's great aspirational stuff, too. And it's a real challenge for schools like ISP because those, that's a high, if you just want to say, our kids are going to learn more math, history, and geometry, geography than they could anywhere else, that would be an easy challenge. But this is tough, this is tough stuff to deliver on because every day you got to manufacture it anew. Uh, those of you who sort of chuckle when I said, has your tuition gotten cheaper? Here's a thought I'll leave you with. Schools like ISP hand make a custom crafted education new every day for every kid. That's insanely expensive to do. That's why your tuition is what it is. But it's what works because it drives at these things, which dovetail with what we know will help our kids be successful in the very uncertain and unknowable future. Exercise, uh, I watched a teacher do in a classroom the other day. One child said something about, we're living in the 21st century, and she said, really? Let's talk about the 20th century. What were the greatest things that happened in the 20th century? And the class went on, listed off dozens and dozens of them. She said, now how many of those happened before 1918? And of course, there was only one that was on the list, right? World War I was the only thing on the list. Everything else happened after. She said, we're just starting. We have no idea what this is going to look like in another 30, 40, 50 years. Because they didn't know that in, 20, in 1918 either. So, uh, you know, Eton School in the UK, Eton, have you heard of that before? It's a very famous old boarding school where British royalty have gone and uh, uh, leaders, many British prime ministers have gone to Eton. Here's a quote from the 19th century about what uh, the headmaster at Eton thought was a great school. He said, you go to a great school not so much for knowledge as for arts and habits, for the habit of attention, for the art of expression, for the art of assuming, at a moment's notice, a new intellectual position, for the art of entering quickly into another person's thoughts, for the habit of submitting to censure and refutation, for the, act, for the art of indica uh, indicating assent or dissent in graduated terms, and above all, you go to a great school for self-knowledge. It's about all kinds of things, but this is the stuff that equips our kids to be able to be successful then and now. And it's why I think great schools like ISP matter in the world.
because we are able to accomplish those things with kids. So that's my spiel for you. And I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, talk back to it. Did I say anything today that you, know, you thought was all wet or uh, should, shouldn't have, didn't make any sense or disagree with or, come on. Can I, can I ask about yeah, Steve. Uh, public schools. So you know, a lot of us will transition, whether it's to the United States or maybe a public university. So I mean, public schools can be great too. They can. Far fewer resources. So I guess the question has two parts. What makes a public school great is that it has a little more you know, socioeconomic diversity. And then also as parents transition their kids to a public school, what would you highlight? Ah, great. Um, well, I'm going to have to put a big modifier on, on what I say. Okay, so I, 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 I want to know what I don't know, and I do absolutely zero work in public education anywhere. So um, that's not a, a, a realm where I have any experience to draw upon. Um, so with that disclaimer, um, I'm not going to talk about what makes a great public school, although when typically when I see those lists or uh, when, a, when a magazine does a story about the five cool things in public schools and I, I read them, they sound a lot like your learning principles. They sound like they're doing things that you're doing here. So that's that just the only, only thing I know about that. Transition-wise, um, I'd, I'd say two things. First of all, the field experiences, kids coming out of schools like ISP do really, really well. Uh, the trick is going to be to find a school where they're going to feel like they can continue to do things the way they've gotten used to doing them. Because they may go into an environment that's going to be a little more structured and, um, and dry. Let's put it that way. So I think it's, it's looking for districts that do the kinds of things that you're doing here and have the same sort of student-centeredness. So uh, someone over here said it's, uh, forgive me, back at the beginning, said it's about the students. I walk in, I see things that are about students. That's what I'd say. If you can walk in the district and say, this is about the students, not the teachers, which tends to become characteristic in too many schools, then your kid's going to do just great fitting in. And they're not going to feel bored because they're going to be able to move ahead at their speed. Anyone else? Yes? Um, on one of your slides, you had something about self-paying parents. Yes. Pay. Yeah, I, uh, I, I moved past that one because I didn't want to get, I, I was trying to hit our time point here, and, and I, I can back up to that just briefly. Um, the, the, the 2000 era expat is a rapidly dwindling breed. Um, the 2000 era expat had a full expat package that covered housing, um, school, travel, so forth. It, today, you're either likely, A, not to have a package if you're an expat, or B, you've been grossed up in some way, or there's a cafeteria plan where you get a lump sum and choose how you're going to allocate it. Um, and wh what we know is that when that's true for families, psychologically, it feels like it's self-pay, that they're paying out of their pocket, even though the company would say, well, they get X number of euros benefit for, for it. For them, it still feels like that was income, and now I'm spending. So we're seeing fewer... In international schools like ISP, those, those 350 or so, we see fewer people on the full expat package, more people either self-paying because they're either locals or they're expats in different kinds of industries that don't have expat packages or they've been grossed up or uh, cafeteria in some way where the check is still coming from them. That's the big change. So international school demography is looking more like private independent school demography, say in the States, where everybody's writing a check. Here, more and more people are, are writing, as we don't write, that's, that's so last year. <laughs> uh, direct debit is something now. Uh, but that's a, um, that changes the psychology in parents' minds of what they want. It makes them more price sensitive on the one hand, but they don't demand less. So in fact, we demand more because we want our schools to be doing ever more for us, hence the price point keeps rising. So it's, it's just a different psychological mix within so schools. No, no, I'm saying they have greater price point sensitivity. Okay. Because I, I, heard, I heard that from somebody here, that there was a difference. I, you know, um, I, 
what I would say the difference, that would be a, that would be a covariate, uh, if, if you know statistical terms, it's not what's, it's correlation, it's not what's driving it. What's driving it isn't that I'm paying. If I'm on an expat package and I know I'm in the country for two years, the incentive to get deeply engaged isn't there. Uh, if I'm there longer, I think it correlates with length of time you're likely to be in a school. But now, really what I was meaning by that is that price sensitivity comes up, um, even as we're saying all the more things that we're asking schools to do. And so my son did his first week without walls, and he went to prompt the table. And they had their cell phones taken away for the day. And they had to do manual labor, actually, on the farm. And so some of the kids cried. Some of the kids cried. <laughs> 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 it was for it was, it was a long period of time. You also visited Gaza, where there's a lot of disruptions going on there. The so how are schools preparing our students for disruptions in their future, which could be small, or major, um, just from World War I, 1918. Think that it's 100 years from now. That society faced a huge disruption in the social fabric, yet made it through somehow. Could this society make it through that kind of disruption? Wow, that's, you know, there's a great question over a beer sometime. Um, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I mean, it because we, that's, I'm not sure in, in 1914 or 1913 that people would have said, wow, if there was that cataclysmic event, we'd have, although I'm not sure we got through that all that well, if you look at what, what came later. Um, the, um, it's back to those, to the, the skills to figure stuff out, isn't it? it it's, um, there, there's a, a uh, a book about uh, educational theory, which, was, which is interesting. I, I, I remember a quote from it, I, many things I didn't agree with, but one was about st students need the skills to recreate civilization if they needed to. Um, and, and maybe there's that piece of it that we need to make sure our students, what I think you are talking about is um, the R word, resilience. And that, uh, some, some people use the G word, grit. But to me, this resilience gets a little bit more. It's that ability to, um, to have things go really, really different than you think they're going to and be able to roll with it. Flexibility. Uh, someone here, here used the flexibility word. Um, and and that's, that's more of an emotional skill set we need. So uh, that's also on the, the menu of what schools are having to equip kids with. Anybody else? Great, great question. I, I Dorota? Have a question. So, well, it, it looks like we are, you know, in a, in a time when we are running without script. I, I feel like, as a parent... We are <laughs> running without... With script. Yes, without, 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 without scripts, yeah. right. So, I, I, my parenting, I, I don't have a script anymore. Although I have two older kids, and I felt like 10 years ago I had a script, but, you know, within, within not even a generation, it was thrown away. Uh, but also, um, you know, because your parents in the school, and now I see that somehow schools are running without screen as well. Uh, and the changes are, you know, picking up. So the schools, the, <coughs> the changes within schools should pick up as well. So how to, uh, how to judge the, the school, as a parent, uh, how to judge the school is changing towards the right direction? If you could name three features that will help us to uh, keep the common sense yeah. and the mental health in place and just give us a bit of stability and direction in thinking if the changes within schools and education are going in, a, in the right direction for our kids. Okay. How, how to, so, how to know Arnie's doing the right stuff. Okay. That's the... Um, <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what I would look for. Um, and, and maybe it's the social scientist in me. Uh, I would look for an evidentiary basis. Is there, does this, what the school's doing, connect to, to, the, to the known scholarship about teaching and learning, to neuroscience, to, to those things? And, and with that track record, then I'd be, it, it'd be the same thing if, you know, if my physician says we're going to change your medication, I want to know what the evidentiary basis is behind that and what I'm, what I'm losing and what I'm getting by that. So the same thing about school, we're going to change this. What's, what's, what's the evidentiary basis here? So is it rooted in scholarship and, and brain science? Those are the questions I'd ask. That, that's one thing. 
Um, a second thing I would be asking myself as I see it is, does this equip my kid to figure stuff out better? I'd, I'd use that test. Does this equip them to be able to apply what they know to manipulate stuff in the world, uh, not just uh, take a test or do a tabletop project then that, that, that's a static evidence of learning? I think those are the things I'd look at, Dorota, uh, to, to know. I'm going to push just to back up gently on the idea that schools are running without scripts. Um, I think in some ways th there's, they, they are around such things as uh, the economic model and building the uh, kind of community with, with the diversity that we have in schools. But there's a whole lot of great science about how people learn and about how different kinds of kids learn best. We aren't terribly far off. Uh, it, it, none, none of us are gonna probably see it with our ki kids, none of you will see it with your kids, but I may see it with my grandkids if I have any. We're not far off a point where schools will be designing programs for kids' DNA. So there's a, a whole new, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of good science behind this stuff. That script is there how we find a way to bring a community along with it and understand what it means for their kids, that's the place where schools are having to go without scripts because it's, it's gotta be a community-wide dialogue, which is why I'm so glad you're all here. Yeah, but it's, it's probably, you, you made the right observation, but it's more for our grandchildren, but right now we are still facing this, you know, as parents, certain yeah. decisions uh, and choices within the next 10 years. Yeah, and I'd also say that one of the things that parents lack marks observations. So, uh, although I think a number of my colleagues in the mental health field would, would agree, uh, I'm not an educator, I'm a mental health professional. Uh, what, what we all lack as parents, I knew I did, was confidence. And we, we, we kind of know what's the right thing to do, but we're scared. And we're, we're more subject to doubt ourselves, maybe, than our parents were, for better or worse. So I think one of the things, tools you have is you have a, um, a very like-minded community or as like-minded as it gets here at ISP that, that shares in, in that sense of how, how can we parent in this age? Um, and the, you know, the, I mentioned the, 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 the smartphone and its effects on mental health. Um, the, the curious thing is parents say two things about that. We know it because we focus grouped it, we've surveyed it, we have the data. Parents say, the smartphone is the bane of my kid's existence. Mm -hmm. I hate it that they have it every day, but I never want her to be without it mm -hmm. because that way she can reach me if she needs to or reach someone if she needs to. So, wow. Uh, I think that being in a like-minded community that sorts through this stuff together is, is about as good as it gets. Okay. Uh, one, one more question. Sometimes we have, to, well, we have to try to school as an institution. We are here for, for, for the class. Uh, back to the question, I would go to Arnie or Mark or Therese or anyone else on the staff and say, what's the, what's the evidence behind this? Uh, what support's doing it this way? And they're going to tell you. My, my guess is, and I'm gonna, I don't want to put words in Arnie's mouth, but they haven't done anything here for which they can't point to an evidentiary basis for why it's done. And the, the same would be true. I'm not, I'm not saying blind trust at all. I don't blind trust my physician. Uh, but when I go to my physician, I tore a hamstring uh, doing something really stupid a couple of months ago. And I said, you know, what do I do with this? He said, well, we could do surgery, uh, in which case you're going to be off it for a while. You're not going to be traveling. You know, you're going to be this kind of thing. He said, or you can just kind of let it heal, in which case it's going to take a long time, but you can keep, keep living your life in the meantime. And I said, so what's the data, you know, when it's over? So we, we talked about the studies and what the risks are. And the, that, he, he made a recommendation based on evidence. Um, when I went home and told my wife that, she said, wait a minute, you have to have the surgery, you gotta get this fixed. 
And I said, well, now I'm, I'm going to go with, with that one because I trust the evidence behind it, not that, that he told me to. I think the same thing is here for Arnie or anyone else in the school. What's the evidence behind this and how does that relate to what the school's doing? And smart schools, great schools, can show you that evidentiary basis. And the more it sounds like they just pulled it out of their pocket, uh, the more you can distrust it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, we, it's definitely, we see that in the, in the school, in the school we want to implement. Uh, yet, there is another side of the story. That there is the saying that only, uh, only senators change uh, slower than school. So how to, you know, how to convince the community and, and put the community with the, with the pace of change? What would be your recipe? Yeah. Well, you saw the picture of Sumerian school, which is you know, mm -hmm. 4,000 years old. Uh, this this theory doesn't change that much. It's because we're all so very cautious about our kids. And we may not have liked how we went to school, but you know, it, that's how we went to school. And we're, we're loath to try something that feels experimental, which is why I think I have to keep going back to the evidentiary basis. Bring the community along, here it is. Except you, know, you all are the usual suspects, probably. You're, you're, you're probably the people that come to stuff like this. I think you have to keep engaging the whole community in a conversation about what we're doing, how it, how it relates to that, and what the evidence is behind it that makes us the case, and you keep talking about it. School heads that say, uh, we're going this way because I think it's best follow me, tend to have short career paths in, in a given school because the community doesn't just follow them. We don't, for better or worse, and I think it is both, we don't trust that much anymore. Great school heads are able to articulate that basis for why we're doing it. Thank you, Arnie. I know we have more time. Let's get up and chat. I'll be around. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, summarize a few things because great conversation. And I so appreciate Mark is here. As Mark said, as we always do, there'll be time after I shut up for you to continue to chat with Mark informally as well. But I did want to say a few things, um, obviously, because a lot of discussion pertained to ISP, the direction of the school, and so on. <clears throat> I said at the beginning, and I, uh, we really mean this, parents have to be part of this conversation. So that's one piece about the change question. We cannot change without the parent community. I am impatient as a, as a leader and as an educator. I want to change a lot faster than we're changing. I'll admit that up front. But I also have a lot of experience. So there has to be a process of uh, engagement around the issues that you mentioned and others have mentioned. Everything we do at ISP is carefully researched. We cannot stand still. We have to be courageous uh, and move schools forward because that is in the best interest of our students. And we will, that is the kind of school we are. There are a lot of schools that play it very safe, as Mark said, because people want their kids to be educated and for it to be, look like the way they were educated because for better or for worse, that's what they know. But you don't want your hospital or your doctor functioning that way. I'm not sure why you would want a school to be like that either. But we have to take informed, calculated chances. We encourage every teacher to take risks, to ask provocative questions about their practice, and then show evidence based on those questions about whether they have made a significant impact on kids' learning. Every single teacher at ISP is required to have a professional inquiry and we have a whole process involved where they work with the principals. It is part of our professional growth model so that every single teacher is not only encouraged but expected to try new things. Because if they don't, then there will not be very much progress. And the, we're being as bold as we think we can be with the support of the parent community. Because if we get too far past the parent community, then we won't be able to make the, cha the wonderful changes we've made in the school. So uh, I want to thank Mark. I didn't know what his presentation was going to, the specifics of his presentation, but I, I so appreciate his conversation with you about uh, what is relevant to kids. It's what we talk about at ISP all the time. Our mission talks about an authentic global education. Authentic means real world. This is a very important one. Learners know what they're learning and why is it significant. When a student raises their hands and says, why am I learning this, the answer cannot be, it's on the test, it's in the curriculum, 
you'll, you'll get a good grade. Those aren't why answers that suffice anymore. They need to understand, and we need to understand why kids are learning what they're learning, and that's what we focus on at ISP. So I, 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 there were two other things I wanted to add. One is that there's a definition of learning that goes on top of these learning principles, which were created over the past few years. So even though we understand as educators what is learning, we want it to be explicit. And by the way, the accreditors, to answer your question about evidence, we had a two-year accreditation process, and they, they both, uh, Council of International Schools and New England Association of Schools and Colleges, have submitted uh, copious reports about ISP. Those reports are available to any parent in the community. They spent a week at the school, eight people fanning out, interviewing, watching learning happen. That's also evidence about the kind of school we are. The definition of learning, this is ISP's definition of learning that belongs on top of the learning principles. Learning is a transformative process that builds on what we know and can do, deepens what we understand, and changes who we are. That is our definition of learning. That was not a quote from anywhere. That's something that we created over a lot of uh, collaborative work. And that's what we're all operating on. This is what we expect every teacher in the school. This is the evidence we look for. Do learners know what they're learning and why it's significant? Uh, do learners know that, uh, where they are as learners and how to go forward? We can look for evidence of those things. We can talk to kids. We can uh, assess kids in different ways and look for that evidence. That's what our expectation is of learning at ISP. One final quote, uh, which is a favorite of mine from Alvin Toffler, who said this in the 1970s, and it's truer today than it ever was before. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And that is all about adaptation and flexibility and figuring out how to navigate the world and face all the challenges that come forward. So I want to once again thank Dr. Frankel. He will be here uh, to chat with you further. I also want to make sure that you know that our head librarian, Jay Sher, is here. You want to come up for a quick second? She always brings lots of books. Uh, connected to the topic and other issues, so turn over to Jay. I don't need to say much. They're here. I hope that you will look through them. I will mention, though, I did not bring iGen, which um, Dr. Frankel mentioned, but there are a couple copies in the library. If you would like to read that book or any others that you're interested in, stop by. Um, of course, what we have, we're happy to share with you, but we'll also order for you if there are books of interest that you know of or you're interested in ebooks or audiobooks, we can set you up with that as well. So please come look at what we have and ask questions, check anything out, help us to create a library that's useful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you.